Now this is a fun problem. In fact, I would say this is one of those problems that uh, someday after I've been dead for many years and they, they write something on my tombstone, I hope maybe this is one of the candidates for what they write. I really like this problem. So what is it? Uh, this is about the sneetches. Now in case you're wondering what is exactly a sneetch, I, I happen to have brought a stuffed sneetch with me, so that's, that's what a sneetch is. And here we go. So the star belly sneetches had bellies with stars. The plain belly sneetches had none upon theirs. Then one day Sylvester McMonkey McBean came to town with his wondrously wonderful machine. Just one pass through, hop on board, and you will have a star for sure. The Sneetches listened, and the Sneetches thought, and those who wanted a star belly stepped up and bought. Sylvester kept track of the proportion of Sneetches with stars, and noticed with time and months that P prime is equal to 1 third T times 1 minus P squared. <laughs> now his business was quick, he did not want to delay, and so he recalled on his very first day that P equals 1 fourth. To make a quick buck and then leave this place, he decided to leave when P equals three-fourths. How many months then will it take until Sylvester McMonkey McBean leaves this place? All right, so there's a lot of words, but certainly we're drawn to a couple of things like, oh, there's this formula. You know, the eye draws towards mathematical notation. In fact, if you have a word problem, you, you say, oh, what do I need to grab? You start looking for numbers or equations. So what do we have? Well, we're told P prime is 1 third T times 1 minus P quantity squared. There are some other things. Well, initially on the first day, P equals 1 fourth. Now we have to think about what does it mean when we talk about initially? When did things happen? So uh, that says that P of some time equals one-fourth. And so here's the thing. When we talk about something like initially happening, we mean zero. And I know you're so used to saying, shouldn't it be one, you know, the first day, right? Well, you've been, uh, you've been, say, corrupted, I will say, by the pocket of big one. You know, no, 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 zero, zero. That's where we start things. Those are our initials. Okay, so here's what we have. We have this differential equation and an initial condition. And what do we want to find? We don't want to find P of T. What do we want? Well, we want to find a time. So the question is about how many months? That's time. So we want to find T where Sylvester McMonkey McBean leaves. When will that happen? Well, when the, the P of T equals 3 fourths. So that's what we're after. Okay, so let's begin. So what we have is a differential equation. It's, it's the kind we've talked about. It's a separable differential equation. So dp dt, that's one third times t times one minus p quantity squared. And now what we do is we rearrange. So remember the process. If you have a differential equation, separate. That's step one. So we want to get everything with the P on one side, everything with the T on the other side. So separation, I divide both sides, say, by 1 minus P quantity squared, and multiply both sides by the DT. Whoops, I forgot my T. Oh, there we go. we will put it right there. T times 1 third DT. There we go. All right. So now we've done the separate. The next step is to integrate. So we're going to integrate both sides. So we're now changing gears into phase two. Now one of these is pretty straightforward. The integral of t, well that's one half t squared. So there's a third. So that would end up giving us one six t squared. And then we toss on a constant. The other side maybe is not so obvious. How would we integrate one over one minus p quantity squared? What should we do? Do the substitution. So here, let's uh, do a little bit of work on the side. The integral dp over quantity 1 minus p squared uh, will let u equal 1 minus p. Then du would be minus dp. So I can say that minus du is plus dp. So this becomes 
minus du over u squared. Or, to make it more friendly to integrate, that's minus u to the minus 2 du, because we like to have things as powers, something to a power. So now to integrate, this will become minus from that minus. Then we will add 1 to the exponent. So negative 2 plus 1 gets us up to negative 1. And then we're going to divide by negative 1, which is the same thing as multiplying by negative 1. And so what we'll end up with is the two minuses cancel. u to the minus 1 is 1 over u. And of course, that becomes 1 over 1 minus p. So I can put that here. So 1 over 1 minus p is equal to 1 6 t squared plus c. So our next thing to do is to uncomplicate. So you separate, you integrate, uncomplicate, which means you need to solve for c and maybe possibly for p. Let's solve for c. How did we solve for c? Yeah, we use our initial condition. So what do we get? Well, we'll say that 1 over 1 minus 1 fourth is equal to 1 6 times 0 squared plus c, because I'm putting in t equals 0 and p equals 1 fourth. So 1 6 times 0 squared, that's simple. 1 over 1 minus 1 fourth, that's 1 over 3 fourths, also known as 4 thirds. So we get that c equals 4 thirds. And we can now update 1 over 1 minus p is equal to 1 6 t squared plus 4 thirds. Now we come to what we're after. See, this is a slightly different type of question. We're not after our function p of t. We're after something else. We're after a particular time when our output will be 3 fourths. So we're solving for t. So here we come and say, all right, if I want to know when does p of t equal 3 fourths, we can do the following. Let's plug in p equals 3 fourths. So I can plug it into here, and then once I have that, solve for t. So 1 over 1 minus 3 fourths. Let's see if we can do that. 1 over 1 minus 3 fourths, what would that be? It would turn into 1 over a fourth, which is 4. That's 1 6 t squared plus 4 thirds. Well, now what can we do? Well, we can say that 1 6 t squared is equal to 4 minus 4 thirds, because I can take that 4 thirds across. And to get 4 minus 4 thirds, well, that's 12 thirds minus 4 thirds, which is 8 thirds. Now multiply both sides by 6. If I multiply 8 thirds by 6, what's the output? 16. So t squared is 16. So what is t? t is 4. So the answer is that Sylvester McMonkey McBean will leave this place in four months' time. So that's the answer. It worked out kind of nice. Well, whew, should we be surprised? Not so much. All right, so what are we doing today? Well, today we're going to talk about logarithms. And I know we've talked about logarithms before, but I want to talk about sort of a different way to think about logarithms. And where did we come from? Well, the old idea for thinking about where our logarithm is coming from is to say, hey, you know, this function log is the inverse of e to the x, which is all right. It's, it's a true statement. But now the question is, how do you go about calculating e to the x? That's not so clear. I mean, certainly some things like e squared, that makes sense. It's e times e. Even square root of e, that's not so bad. But e to the pi, what does that mean? How do you compute it? So there's uh, another way to approach this, which is sort of to, to flip things around and say, look, Instead of starting with e to the x and getting log, let's start with log and get e to the x. 
And the way that log can be defined is we can actually define log in terms of integration. So log of x will be defined to be the integral from 1 up to x of 1 over t dt. And that's just saying, let's just start with that basic assumption. So what happens? Well, now, instead of saying uh, first define e to the x, now we have log x defined. And so e to the x is the inverse of log x. That's all, all right. But here's the great thing, is I can actually talk about log of any number now. And it makes sense, because log of a number just says, how much area is there underneath that curve between, say, 1 up to pi? I can do that. I can talk about the area underneath that curve from 1 to pi, or 1 to 4, or 1 to 100. That's area. And I can talk about how to estimate that. And I can get arbitrarily high precision if I'm just patient enough and I spend a lot of time doing small, tiny estimates. OK. So we're going to use this to establish properties of logs, basically only using geometry and a little bit of knowledge of calculus. Now, our basic geometric tool is going to be what we call scaling. So scaling, just you can think of it as a stretching in a particular direction. And it has a very easy effect on area. And, and since we're thinking about log now as an area, let's just check our understanding. So here's a rectangle. It's A times B. Well, how much area is there in their A by B rectangle? A times B, yeah. Not too surprising. Now suppose you scale one side. So suppose I scale it so the, the length here is now k times as long. What's the area in this rectangle? Same height, but the length has been scaled. We get, don't worry, there's no, there's no trick here. That comes next. Yeah, it's k times ab. So the scaling factor comes in. So if I scale in one direction, I scale the area by k. Now I could have scaled in the other direction. Let's suppose I scaled by 1 over k. Well, then the area, no big surprise, is 1 over kab. Now the fun thing. Suppose I scale both directions, but I scale by different amounts. So in the lengths, I scale by k. The height, I scale by 1 over k. What's the area? It would be ab. So in other words, the scaling factors cancel out. So these two rectangles, which are different, the shapes will have the same amount of area, because we can somehow find a way to scale. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it turns out now, if you think about this curve, this, this curve is not just any curve. See, this is the 1 over t curve. So if I think of this as the y equals 1 over t curve. So if I'm at a point here, let's call it, for lack of imagination, a comma 1 over a. Well, suppose I come over here to a point a k. What's the y coordinate? Well, it's 1 over a times k. So what you can think of is you've scaled the x-coordinate by k, and you scale the y-coordinate by 1 over k. So that's really nice. And what it means is we get the following. See, we can now talk about scaling the shape. So if I start with the curve, 1 over x, and I'm looking at the area from c up to d, this little area here, what I can do is I can now scale. I'm scaling the x direction by a factor of k and the y direction by a factor of 1 over k. And what's going to happen is that this reddish area becomes this greenish area. Point for point, every single point translates over. So the left-hand side, that becomes k times d. The right-hand side becomes k times d. And because of the curve, because it's that curve, 1 over, that top part does do a translation. So it all fits in very nicely. All right, so now properties of logs. We start with an easy one, log of 1. Well, our definition for log 
says that log of 1 would be the integral from 1 up to whatever you plug in, which is 1 of 1 over t dt. Well, what does that turn out to be? It's 0. There's no area because there's no width to integrate over. All right. Let's establish some other properties. Uh, we want to show that log of 1 over c is minus log of c. Okay. So, let's think about what's happening here. Suppose we come here, we draw our curve, 1 over x, and let's say this is at 1, and let's go up to c. So I want to look at this area I have here. But what I want to do is I want to find another area, another region, which would have the exact same amount of area. And here's the idea, is let's choose to scale. So one way we can scale is to say, I really want to make sure I keep an end at 1. Because the integral definition of log says I have to have one of my ends stay at 1. Well, this is when the left end is at 1. So the only other thing we can do is let's put the right end at 1. So how can I scale c to get to 1? What's my scaling factor? 1 over c. So I'm going to scale this by a factor here of 1 over c. And if I do that, I'll get one end, this right end becomes 1. Where's the left end going to become? And the answer is 1 over c. So scaling by 1 over c. And now, this philosophy says, lo and behold, these two areas have to be the same. So in other words, the area on the left has to match the area on the right. So we know that we have the following. Well, that log of c, that's equal to the integral from 1 up to c of 1 over t dt. That's this piece here. But according to that, it's also equal to, because I can come over to here, the integral from 1 over c up to 1 of 1 over t dt. Because this is saying the areas match, the same totals. Well, here, this is almost the definition of log we just gave. What's wrong? The 1 is in the wrong place. I want the 1 downstairs. So if I flip the order of integration, what does that do to the sign? It negates it. Minus 1 to 1 over c, 1 over t dt. And now, lo and behold, that's minus natural log of 1 over c, which is what we want. So we've shown that log of c is negative log 1 over c. It's not quite there. It's equivalent to what's written there. OK, well, now let's do the other one. So log of a, b is log of a plus log of b. All right, well, so we, we start, we have our sketch. Say, all right, what can we do? Well, let's say here's one. It's not in the right place, but that's okay. I need some space. And uh, let's say here we'll call this A, and then somewhere over here we'll call this AB. All right. Well, what can we do? What can we do? If we think about our pieces, this piece right here, well, that's easy. This is simply the same as the integral from 1 up to a of 1 over t dt, because that's how we're defining it. All right, no surprise. Now let's take a second and look at the one right next to it. So we have this piece right here. What can we do with that piece? 
Well, let's scale. We want to have an end be 1. So how can I scale to get this to become 1? I would have to scale by 1 over a. Because remember, the integral definition for log says you start at 1. So by scaling, what we can get is that this is the same as going from 1 up to where? Well, multiply 1 over a times ab, we get b. So if we scale, then that second piece is that. So that means that the second piece is the same as the integral from 1 to b of 1 over t dt. And finally, of course, if we put the two pieces together, well, it's the same as going from 1 up to ab. So we get collectively, this is the integral from 1 up to ab of 1 over t dt. And now we just put the, everything in place. This integral is the definition of log of ab, because it's, you're going from 1 up to ab. The first integral we talked about is the definition of log of a. And the second piece, after you scale, we get to the definition of log of b. So log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. So we can establish that property of logarithms. Now, where did the properties of integration comes in, come into play? And the answer is that the property of integration we're using is that we can break up the integral from 1 to a, b into two pieces, 1 to a and a to a, b. So that's how we did that. All right. Well, a few more things we should do. Um, What's the derivative of natural log? Well, that one's a freebie. Because if we want to take the derivative of natural log, now it's saying take the derivative of the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. And if you integrate from 1 to x of 1 over t dt, the answer becomes 1 over x. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, I will say that natural logs are a fantastic tool. And uh, depending upon how young your parents are, they may not know about these things. There's something called a slide ruler. So a slide ruler was used back in the 60s and 70s, and it was done to do computations. You might have to go talk to your grandparents at this point. But what it was done, it was said, you know, you can transform problems that are difficult, say multiplication, into problems that are easy, say addition, by using logarithms. So they are a wonderful tool, and they show up quite a lot. Now, one of the things that we have is the following. Um, this is a nice fact. If you ever have an integral where you have a derivative of a function over the function, then you get that the integral of that is log of the function. It's easy to see if you just think about it. It's not anything subtle. I mean, there's two ways to check. How do you check if something is an antiderivative? Well, you can actually do the antiderivative and see if you get the same answer. But another way is just to take the derivative of, of the, say, the right-hand side. If you take the derivative of this right-hand side, and what you end up with is f prime of x over f of x, then it's the right answer. So suppose we do our chain rule. The derivative of natural log is 1 over. So it's 1 over the inside, and then what? times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. So these do match. You could, of course, come over here and said, let u equal f of x, du is f prime of x dx. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times that there are 10 derivatives that you're going to need for calc 2. And we had 8. So we were missing 2. So let's finish our list of 10. So that when you go into calc 2 next semester, you've got all 10 ready to go. So what are they? This is one of them. What's the integral of tangent theta? Well, let's think about a different way to write tangent theta. How can I write tangent theta? Sine over cosine. So now, the question becomes, 
can I, am I in this setting where we just talked about involving a lot? Do I have something which looks like a function downstairs and a derivative upstairs? It seems close, right? So let's, let's go ahead and see what happens. So suppose we let u equal cosine theta. What's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. So it's close enough because a negative is easy to fix. So move the minus across, then this would become equal to minus du over u. So that's negative natural log plus c. Now to finish it off, we, we put back what is u. So this is minus log of cosine. Well, maybe we don't like a minus. What can we do with that minus to get rid of it, or to hide it, if you will? <coughs> You're probably thinking, maybe if I just casually put a pen here, then no one will see it. No, 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 that's, that's not what I'm, I'm referring to. We have a natural log. Is there anything we can do with natural log and that minus? Well, the answer is you can move it up into the exponent. Because there's another property of log. We didn't actually prove this property. But if I have log of a to the power b, that's the same as b log of a. So I'll write that down. Log of a to the power b is the same as b log of a. So if I have something in front, I can move it in as an exponent. If I take cosine to the negative 1 power, what's the result? 1 over cosine, which is secant. So we get log secant theta. All right, so there we go. There's one of our nice facts. Integral of tangent theta d theta is log secant theta. All right. Now we're up to 9. Good. You're probably thinking, wait, we just used the other tools. Is it really 9? Yeah, you should know this one. It shows up often enough. It's just good to know it. Now the fun one. The one that kind of just uh, appears out of nowhere. It's a good one. Find the integral of secant theta. See, this way we'll complete our trigonometric set. We've got the sine, we've got the cosine, we just added tangent. Secant, once we have that, we pretty much have a full set. Now this one is subtle, insofar as it, what we're about to do is not so clear that that would be the first thing to try. And I want to be clear that the mathematics that you, you get to experience at this point in your life is mathematics that people thought about for decades and, and uh, so this, what we're about to do, someone probably spent five years thinking about it until one day they're like, what if I try this idea? So I don't want to trivialize what we're doing. It's, it's actually hard to come up with ideas. And uh, oftentimes it's just a matter of being patient. Be patient and a good idea will come. So let's at least think if we can think about the hint. So you have the integral of secant. Now, in some sense you might say, oh, well that's just one over cosine. But now it's like, I can't do that substitution I did before. That doesn't work. So where are we going? Well, in some sense, we like to say, all right, where does secant show up as a derivative? In general, that's a good strategy. If I'm trying to find an antiderivative, I can say, well, where are things that are like this where it was a piece of the derivative? Maybe I can start there. Can we think of any functions whose derivative involves secant? Tangent involves secant, that's right. If you took the derivative of tangent theta, well, you ended up with a secant squared. Any other function? Secant. Yeah, if you took the derivative of secant theta, well, you ended up with, I'll explain why I have that equal sign there in a second, is secant theta tangent theta. Now, why that equal sign? Well, because I just want to point out that another way to think of secant squared is secant times secant. So here's sort of the, huh, isn't that interesting? See, when we took the derivative of, of tangent, there wasn't any tangent over here, it was both secants. 
So I can think of it as there's like there's a single secant, and then, well, secant one and secant two, maybe. All right. And now when I took the derivative of secant, well, there was a again there was a, a single secant and a tangent. Well, that's weird because there was no tangent there. And now here's probably what happened. I'm I'm making a wild guess. If somebody said, isn't this strange that you sort of have this crossover here? Where you, you take the derivative of tangent or take the derivative of secant, there's always a, a secant and then something else, but it's sort of like the other thing. So they said, here's an idea. Let's take the derivative of the sum and see what happens. So if we take the derivative of tangent theta plus secant theta, what do we get? Well, we'll get secant squared theta times, uh, sorry, plus secant theta tangent theta, which is secant theta, I can pull out the common thing, secant theta plus tangent theta. And now, here's the weird thing. When I take the derivative of this function, I get the function back, but with an extra secant theta. So what's the point of that? Well, in some sense, if I let my f of x equal tangent theta plus secant theta, then, oops, f, prime, f of theta, f prime of theta is equal to, well, it's right here. All right, I won't write that down. All right. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the, the coming out of the blue thing that's about to come out of the blue. All right, all right. Well, what do we have? Okay, so we have that f prime of theta over f of theta is equal to secant theta. That's what we have. Because there's our f prime, there's our f. We integrate both sides. Because if two functions match, the antiderivatives match up to a constant c. So notice, that's what we're after. We're after the integral of secant theta. So, according to our rule, the integral of secant theta, well, the integral of f prime over f is the natural log of f. Right? Because I'm just applying the rule toss on a plus c. But what was our f? The natural log of tangent plus secant. So there's the integral of secant. So the integral of secant theta is the natural log, most people say secant theta plus tangent theta just because it, it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Kind of, you wouldn't guess that. So it's good that we have People who, who spent their lifetime guessing it and were able to find one or two correct answers and shared it with us so that we didn't have to guess it from the start. There are other ways to derive this answer, by the way. And by the time you take calculus two, we'll show you a way to derive it, assuming you didn't have anything clever to do. It would just take you a little bit longer and you have to have more tools. All right, so that's what I want to say about the log and various things. I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about a very special collection of functions. And these are called the hyperbolic functions. And they show up. And they're actually really important functions. And depending upon where you go, they might play a big role and they might not. So I want to make sure that you've at least heard of them before you leave calculus. So we call these hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. Sometimes we call these cosh and singe. So cosh, hyperbolic cosine, singe, hyperbolic sine. And what they are is they represent the even and odd parts of e to the x. Now any function can be split into an even part and an odd part. So the even part, you take the function e to the x, add the function of e to the negative x, which essentially it's the mirror function, and then divide by two. 
for the odd part, you, instead of adding, you take the difference and divide by two. And you, you can see some things happen that are really nice. So for instance, if you were to add these two together, what do you end up with? You add these two up. You end up with the e to the x. The, the e to the minus x terms cancel out. So what you've done is you split e to the x up into something which is even and something which is odd. And you can see it, the, the graphs are shown here below. This is the Koch graph on the left hand side and it has our even symmetry. This is the Singe graph on the right hand side and it has our symmetry where if you plug in a value at a and if you plug in negative a, it's same in magnitude but different in sign. All right, so these are the curves. I claim that these are important curves and they show up. Um, have you ever seen the Koch curve? Have you ever been like out in the wild and said, oh my gosh, there's a Koch curve over there. Do you see that? And your family is like, are you sure that's a Koch curve? That looks like a parabola. Like, no, 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 that's definitely a Koch curve. All right, let me uh, draw something perhaps very suggestive. Uh, well, mildly suggestive. Okay, so imagine, I, I don't have my, my, my blue, but imagine you got some water under here, some green water. They had an algae infestation. And now imagine that you had pillars here. And they were connecting a roadway underneath. All right? So if you've been, for example, to say San Francisco, there's something called the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay? This curve here that you see when you hang a cable and just let it hang down, that's the Koch curve. It's not a parabola. It's, it's actually the hyperbolic cosine curve. And it has a very nice function. So a hanging chain satisfies that it is a, a Koch curve. So that's why I say you might see it. It depends upon where you end up. So I want to talk about some various properties about Koch and Sinch. Um, so let's talk about their derivatives. So let's take the derivative of the Sinch curve. Well, what is that? Well, the derivative of the Sinch, that's the derivative of e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2, because that's how Sinch is defined. All right, let's take that derivative. If we take that derivative, well, the over 2 is just going to stick around. The derivative of e to the x, e to the x. The derivative of minus e to the minus x, what will that be? Plus. Yeah, plus e to the minus x. Now, does that look familiar? It should. It's Koch. So when you take the derivative of the Singe curve, you get the Koch curve. All right. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Let's do the other one. So suppose now we take the derivative of Koch. All right. If we take the derivative of Koch, that's the derivative of, we'll put what the Koch curve is, e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. All right, the over 2 is going to stick around. Derivative of e to the x, e to the x, derivative of e to the negative x, minus e to the minus x. So what is that? It's Singe. So if you take the derivative of the Koch curve, you get the Singe curve. Take the root of the Singe curve, you get the Koch curve. It's really nice and simple and elegant. So for instance, suppose I were to take 100 derivatives of the Singe curve. What would I get? If I take 100 derivatives, I'll end up with Singe. Why? Because I alternate back and forth. So after one derivative, I'm at Koch. Another derivative, I'm back to Singe. Then I'm back to Koch, then I'm back to Singe. So in the odd derivatives, I switch to the other function. The even derivatives, 
I come back to where I started. So since 100 is an even number, if I start with singe, I'll be back at singe. We don't even have to pay attention to the signs because there's no plus minus going on. It's, it's far better. So we can also talk about integration. If you were to integrate Cauch, what would you get? Singe. If you integrate singe, what do you get? Cauch. You're thinking, that's amazing. That's amazing. And then someone said plus C. Okay, yeah, all right, all right. If you want full points, yes, I suppose you should. I suppose you should. All right. Well, let's uh, mention that, of course, once you have hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, you can do things like hyperbolic tangent and hyperbolic secant. So there's all sorts of strange and beautiful identities. And uh, we should just, I don't know if we'll do all of these. Uh, let's do a couple of these, though. Cauch squared plus sin squared. OK, what do you think? Well, Cauch e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2 squared singe e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2 squared. So if you square everything, you'll get e to the 2x. The cross terms will be what? Well, e to the x plus e to the minus, times e to the minus x just becomes 1. And of course, the cross terms, you have 2ab, so there's a plus 2. And then there's an e to the minus 2x. When you do it over here, you get e to the 2x. Now it'll be a minus 2 plus e to the minus 2x. And I wrote down 2, it should be 4, over 4. Well, the plus 2 and the minus 2 cancel, but that's the only cancellation you, you get. You'll have an e to the 2x over 4 and another e to the 2x over 4. So you end up with e to the 2x, and again, you'll have an e to the minus 2x all over 2, because there's 1 fourth and 1 fourth. What is that? e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x over 2. Can we say what that is? It almost looks like Cauch, except what have we done? We, we, we have Cauch, but instead of plugging in x, you plug in 2x. So this is Cauch 2x. It's a double angle formula for Cauch. This has a different property. All right, let's do another one. Cauch squared minus sin squared. Hmm. So e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2 squared plus e to the x, oh, sorry, minus e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2 squared. And if you do that, well, you'll get e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the minus 2x over 4. Subtract e to the 2x minus 2 plus e to the minus 2x over 4. And what do you see? Well, now different things happen. The e to the 2x's cancel. The e to the negative 2x's cancel. What doesn't cancel is the 2 minus minus 2 makes plus 2. 4 fourths or 1. So co squared minus sin squared is 1. All right. And uh, I don't know. Should we do any, any others? All right. Can you believe? All right. I just, we'll just point something out here. Plus many more cool things. Now, the cool things here are this looks an awful lot like a double angle identity. This looks a lot like Pythagorean theorems. If you ran this one, any guess what you would end up with? It would be singe of, of 2x. Now, when you start seeing things like this, you're like, is this just a wacky coincidence? And the answer is, it's not. See, if you look at this function, cosh and singe, and you, and you see the graph, so you have cosh looking like this, you have singe looking like this, your, your gut reaction says, these don't look anything like trigonometric functions. But here's the crazy thing. They're behaving like trigonometric functions. And the reason that they behave like trigonometric functions is it turns out that cosh and singe are also the cosine and sine functions. 
Now, it seems like a bold statement considering they look nothing like it. But I will say the story about why that's true is a little bit complex. And we'll tell you why at the end of Calculus 2. So that's going to give you motivation to come back and take Calculus 2.